why should we care about, uh, about the SKA? I think first and foremost, obviously, as we understand it, the SKA is going to be our next step in the exploration of the universe. So, um, you know, if you go back into history, if you go back over thousands of years, uh, humankind have been very excited by what happens in the sky. They've had a very close connection to it. Obviously, you can see the stars, you can see the constellations there, you can see the planet Jupiter nicely um, shown above the telescope here, here at Jodrell Bank. And that's sort of been a, that's been a feature of... Um, of, of, of our sort of interaction with the universe for many thousands of years. We built structures to represent that. So here's Stonehenge, very famous structure here in the UK, um, about uh, almost four or 5,000 years old now, which, is, which has some calendrical um, application. So it's designed to align with various, um, act various activities that go on in the sky. Um, if you go to Peru, there's an amazing place called Chanquillo, um, where the whole side of a hill has been sort of gouged out so that the sun rises or the sun sets, depending on which side you stand of this hill as you look to the east or to the west. Um, those sunrises and sunsets at different times of the year come through these gaps in the, uh, in, in the hill that have been gouged out there. Um, more recently, we've got the amazing Antikythera mechanism, which was, uh, uh, which was found in, in, in Greece and which was some sort of early computer, effectively, for calculating these sorts of uh, astronomical events. So it's something, this connection to the, uh, to the sky has been, a, is, has been this sort of long-standing um, fascination for, for humans. Obviously, when we come on to telescopes, um, just 400, over the last 400 years, we've actually sort of managed to improve our view of the, uh, of the universe by using technology. Um, so here's Galileo. Um, I was quite entertained by this picture, this, this, this uh, Galileo I, I met uh, a few months ago in Rome. It's in one of the major... Uh, basilicas in Rome at the back of the at the back of the church you find this five meter high statue of Galileo called Galileo Galilei divine man which is sort of interesting given the history of Galileo's interaction with the uh, with the Catholic Church um, but here he is with his with his telescope and here of course is, is you know a scan of one of his notebooks from uh, from early in 1610 where he's plotting out the positions of the planet Jupiter and the and the moons um, revolving around Jupiter and obviously, over the years since then, we've sort of developed that technology um, largely along the scale of a bit bigger and bigger telescopes. So here's um, this telescope's in Ireland, or was in Ireland, um, Ross's telescope at Burr Castle. Um, it was the biggest telescope in the world for, um, for 70 years, uh, from 1845 to 19, 1900 or so, 1917, in fact, when the Mount Wilson telescope was, was constructed. So there's the 100-inch Hooker that uh, Hubble used to, to, to find uh, galaxies um, moving away from us and sort of prove the, the expanding universe. Um, of course, if you come into more modern times, we've got even bigger telescopes. Um, that's just a picture of me trying to illustrate how big the, the VLT is, uh, which is quite hard to do unless you stand very close to the camera. So an eight meter mirror, um, very big in optical standards, the biggest mirror is around about 10 and a half meters now. Um, so incredible um, technology up on the tops of the mountains there above the clouds. But of course, we've also got space. So for the last sort of um, 50 odd years, we've been able to put things into orbit. And here, of course, the most famous uh, uh, telescope in, in, in orbit, probably even, even still um, the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, it's not just, of course, that, that those are all optical telescopes. Of course, we can go beyond the sort of rainbow visible light. We can go out into the... Uh, to, into, to the invisible part of the spectrum, so out beyond the, beyond the violet and out beyond the red um, to pick up all these other radiations, which of course is sort of meat and drink to a, to a modern astronomer. So most of us would probably um, use um, telescopes or use data that come from right the way across the electromagnetic spectrum and even particles and maybe even at some point gravitational waves as well to tell us uh, more about the, the universe in which we live. In terms of this sort of invisible light, of course, there's just a little compendium of some of the early radio telescopes here, We've got moving, from, um, moving from Jansky in the early 1930s through, through Reber in the later 1930s, and on to the sort of developments that happened um, in the UK and in Australia and in Holland there, and many other telescopes that were constructed around the world. And I think these sorts of, this, this sort of revolution, this sort of moving beyond the visible light, which we'd known about for, you know, for thousands of years, and we'd had the technology to enhance our view of it just for the last 400 years, this really did revolutionize our view of the universe because it, it revealed things that we could, never, um, we could never have otherwise seen. We suddenly saw that the universe was not just full of stars, it was full of um, the quasars, galaxies um, powered by supermassive black holes. It discovered the radiation from the Big Bang, the, the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, so 
I think um, in terms of sort of our modern day telescopes, these are probably some of the iconic um, radio telescopes and I'll, I'll include millimetre telescopes in, in here. So ALMA uh, and the Very Large Array, of course, are the, are the very, uh, perhaps the most famous um, uh, telescopes of this kind today. What, where, does this, where does the SKA fit in with this? Um, well, SKA is basically this next step. So you can see that sort of uh, standard sort of uh, growth in terms of um, the power of these telescopes represented in terms of the uh, the sort of relative sensitivity. So how, what, what, the, what the, in a sense, the faintness of the objects that they can see. So in terms of the bigger and bigger telescopes you make, the fainter and fainter objects you can detect. And that's just in the, in the radio regime. It goes right from Raber at the, back in the, in, in the 1930s up towards the 2020s and SKA. And this is a logarithmic scale. So you can see the sort of uh, massive increases in power of these, uh, of these telescopes. Um, so SKA is this, is this next step. Uh, what does it intend to do? Well, there's some major questions. We all know the big science aims of SKA, but these are the questions that are laid out in the, um, in the prospectuses that have been put together. How do galaxies evolve? How were the first black holes and stars formed? Um, where do magnetic fields come from in space? Uh, was Einstein right about gravity? We'd love to prove Einstein wrong about gravity, I think, but uh, he keeps turning out to be right as we test him to greater and greater precision. Um, what is dark energy? You know, one of the most fundamental questions along with what is dark matter in, in astronomy uh, today. Are we alone in the universe? Perhaps an even more uh, fundamental question which SKA may indeed have some um, capability of, of helping us to, to answer. Um, and finally, of course, the unknown. You know, the, 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 as I mentioned a minute ago, radio telescopes were uh, developed we actually discovered something completely different about the universe that nobody expected. The science case for that big telescope out there was written in the, in the, in the 1940s. Um, you look at that science case now, not, I don't think one thing in that science case is currently being observed by that telescope. All the things that that works on were unknown before that telescope was built. Um, and I think when you, come, when you make such a revolutionary jump um, with something like SKA, you're bound to um, discover things that uh, we don't even know about it at all, and therefore we can't write down these, these questions for. Um, and these things are why we want to build the SK, right? To answer these questions is why we want to build it, and everybody should know that's why we actually want to build it, um, and we should actually be proud of that's why we want to build these things, right? So we shouldn't, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, we should, we should remember that these are not... Um, we're not here to build the SKA to have, particularly have these non-science impacts. It's being built to have these science impacts, but it will make a difference um, to society because if you go back in history and you look at all these great scientific projects, they've made society the way it is today. And the people that were involved in working on those projects did not necessarily know that that was the impact they were going to, they were going to have. So this sort of fundamental blue skies research, I think is, uh, is part of our basic sort of human drive to understand the world around us. And that's what we're doing with these sorts of projects. And there will undoubtedly be uh, things that, that spin out of that, some things that we can predict now, um, but other things that we, we maybe can't. Um, so in terms of valuing this sort of blue skies research, this sort of, you know, uh, in a sense, understanding the, the universe for the sake of understanding the universe around us, um, scientific knowledge is, is obviously the, the, the prime driver. There are some direct spin-offs, and, you, you know, there's pe people here that know much more about that than, than I do, but in, in engineering and technology, for example, there undoubtedly will be, uh, and maybe are already, some direct spin-offs. There's definitely some economic impact to these sorts of big projects. Um, just, just, you know, a very basic level in terms of the jobs created for the people to work on them, for the people to construct them, the manufacturers, the suppliers, maybe even tourism. I'll have something to say about that uh, in, in a moment. Um, and the value to the international community. So it's an international project. There's a, there's a, there's, there's a sort of, um, there's a value to working across, across borders that we, should, we shouldn't um, forget. And then at the end, inspiration. And I think ultimately inspiration of these projects is why we do it. Certainly why I'm interested in doing astronomy. It's why I'm an astronomer. I was inspired. Um, and, it's, and it's something like SKA gets you excited. Uh, and it makes you want to work on the project. It makes you want to use the telescope. It makes you want to try and make those discoveries. And it's why others will actually pay attention to it. It's, you know, it's that, that inspiration is why other people will care. That's what will get people excited. And then, yeah, then you've got to follow on and say, you know, well, what are the sort of medium, long-term impacts? For example, on education, undoubtedly, uh, on, on a, and there will be also be some socioeconomic benefits, un undoubtedly, to this 
um, project. There was, I think um, Simon referred to it earlier, there was a report that was produced by the, by the SKA Programme Development Office in 2010 which looked at these non-science impacts, which I think he was saying that we, you, you might be um, reviewing. And that identified these sort of four areas of so-called non-science benefits, um, that, it was a, that SKA could be a driver for innovation in information and communication technology, uh, sensor technology, that it had impacts in, renew in renewable energy in terms of power in the, the telescope, um, uh, the telescopes themselves, um, that it would have some impact on how science works with industry and works with government, that sort of triangle of, uh, uh, of interaction. And then finally, this sort of how does it impact on, on, human, on human capital, both in terms of the em employment and the development, the thing I just referred to at the end of the previous slide. And actually, I'm just going to put up this slide that, that, that uh, Simon just showed as well, actually, because it's a big, it's a question that you, you know, you will, you do get asked is, you know, why should we spend money on this, um, on, on something like SKA? Why don't we spend this money on something else like, a, you know, a hospital or, 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 or the SKA? And I think the, the example of, that, was, that was produced for the Rosetta mission, the European Space Agency mission, is a really good one because it was, it was I think, uh, universally, as far as I'm aware, praised as a scientific project. It, was, it had a huge impact, um, you know, an incredibly exciting um, mission with incredibly uh, interesting results. And um, this, this infographic is, is pretty good, you know. It was one point in terms of how much the cost of it was. The fact that the 1.4 billion euro uh, mission is, is four jets and is about three euros 50 per European citizen. So about 20 cents per person per year over the lifetime of the project. And the other sort of take home from that was if you added up how much people spent on peanuts per year in the UK, it's actually about the same amount of, as we spend on peanuts. In fact, this project cost peanuts was the sort of, <laughs> was the other line you could take away from that. Now, you know, that, that does not mean to say that it's as, you know, if somebody, you know, wrote you a cheque and said, spend that money on a hospital or spend that money on, 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 on ETA Rosetta or on the SKA, that is not a difficult decision. Clearly, that is still a difficult decision, but it's also fair to set it in the context that these are not, um, in terms of uh, government spending and certainly internationally, these are not ridiculous numbers and we should, we should probably remember that. Um, I thought it might be worth just mentioning um, CERN and the LHC as a sort of analogue for SKA. Um, it's a fundamental physics facility in the same sense that SKA will be. It's an international organisation in the same sense that SKA is, in, in this case with, uh, with 21 member states. Uh, very well known, very well, very well regarded, producing um, amazing science results. We just heard about one of the things that's often stated as the impact of, uh, of, 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 of CERN on, on society, and that's the World Wide Web. I don't know, you've probably seen this. This is Tim Berners-Lee's original suggestion for what became the World Wide Web that his boss wrote on the report, vague but exciting. Um, and you can get, I think you can get T-shirts with that phrase on, actually. Um, so, um, you know, so this was, you know, came, it was basically to do with um, facilitating the science of CERN and became one of the most important impacts on society uh, of recent times. Um, there's a quite an interesting report written by um, Goldfarb a, a few years ago that's worth, perhaps worth uh, looking through, which basically goes through, for the case of the Large Hadron Collider, um, what's in it for the rest of the world, and goes through the various impacts in terms of computing, in medicine, in imaging techniques, in education, collaboration, um, and also in social science and entertainment. So it's worth uh, a sort of look through that because it's not too dissimilar uh, to the sort of range of impacts that might also be uh, uh, ascribed to, to SKA. Uh, and as an example, I know that in the UK here, we, uh, the, the funding body, the STFC, the Science and Technology Facilities Council, had a, had a programme uh, designed to maximise the impact of, of LHC in terms of a communication strategy. It was a four-year strategy. I think this dates from about 2007. Um, so it was prior to, a, to the LHC being switched on. So it's a very targeted approach to, to pushing the LHC out uh, into wider society. A recent outcome of that is the uh, br brilliant Collider exhibition, um, which, is, uh, which was basically taking people inside, um, inside the Large Hadron Collider, but not by having to go to CERN. Um, so you take it into a science museum and you effectively recreate, in some sense, that environment for people to look around and see what a science facility is like. It's a similar issue, of course, for SKAs because of its um, location. 
Um, and that was first on display in the Science Museum in London and is now on an international tour across Europe, Asia and Australia. Um, so I think it's sort of interesting. So I think, I think, the, um, I think CERN is an interesting analogue, but I would say that SKA is different. And SKA is different in one, in one important sense, I think, because of its distributed delivery, right? So it's not in one place. It's not in, you know, on the borders of Switzerland and France and Italy. It's, 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 it's in several places. It's in the telescope it's, itself is in, is in two places. Um, the headquarters is, is here in the UK. So that's a third place. And of course, the map the, in the background itself shows the, uh, the various uh, membership of the of the SKA organization. So it's a really, so it's actually, you know, a very global project, but with this distributed delivery, which I think is sort of, is, is, is very interesting in terms of its, uh, of its potential impact, uh, potentially greater impact. Um, and of course, this is a, in terms of where, where the telescope's located, this is a map from the United Nations Human Development Report of this year. Um, where you can um, select various indices which, the, which this UN group have uh, put together for different countries. This is the sort of composite human, human development index which basically measures, attempts to measure, um, uh, combines three properties basically, basic dimensions of human development they call it, um, a long and healthy life, uh, knowledge uh, and a decent standard of, of living and it combines those things together and they're just colour coded there. And of course you can see that, that, that citing one of the uh, one of the telescopes of SKA in, um, in, in Africa has, has an important um, socio-economic uh, impact um, potentially and, and almost uncertainly in fact. Um, and there are examples of that already and this is just one example of, the, uh, of a, a number of many, many projects that are going on to, um, to work together uh, between partners across the world and partners in Africa to use this as in this particular project. This is the ERAP, um, African Europe European Radio Astronomy Platform, to drive socio-economic development in, uh, in, both, in both Africa and Europe in this case. Um, so I would say that these, these sorts of major scientific projects, they can, inf they can influence sort of d demographic trends. And in fact, I think we have a responsibility to do that. So I think, you know, taxpayers are funding these projects. I think if we can identify a, a need, um, to, uh, then we should, we should try and fulfill that need as part of these projects where, where, where we can. Uh, and I'll just, and another example, so obviously the, the, the previous example of the location in Africa is one, is one particular example for SKA. But another example is, is uh, very important for us here in the UK, and I'm certain in other countries as well, is women in engineering, for example. Um, this is a report from uh, the Institute for Public Policy Research here in the UK just from a few months ago. And this is the sort of really shocking um, statistic for, for us here in the UK. This is showing that um, women are only 7% of the professional engineering workforce in the UK. Uh, and there's a, there's the bar graph there shows you, this, this is very Euro, Eurocentric, so I don't have the numbers for, uh, for other countries, but here's the percentages of engineering professionals who, who, who are women um, uh, tw as of 2012. And if you can read the scale, it has the UK is the one that sits out embarrassingly on the left-hand side, so low. And then we've got Latvia, Sweden, Italy, France, Germany, Denmark, Ireland, uh, and Hungary. Um, and they're all less than 35%. Um, so, you know... So actually, nobody's in a, in a strong position here, uh, but some of us are in, in weaker positions than others. And I, think, um, and I think if we can remember that with a really high-profile project like this, we actually have a chance to, to influence these sorts of trends. And here's another one that just came out recently. This was produced by L'Oreal, actually, who have a Women in Science um, programme. This is to just show you how, uh, how women are underrepresented in their scientific careers. So they go from... Um, these stats are a combination of several different countries, but it goes from the left-hand side there, which shows you some sort of rough parity, it depends what age you pick there, at high school between the numbers of women at the bottom and the numbers of uh, men percentages at the top uh, studying science. And then you go through to degree level, um, to PhD level, to sort of early career researcher, and then to the senior academic positions, and then finally to scientific Nobel Prizes at the end, which sits at 3% women, 97% men. And so you see this general trend of this divergence that tells you that, you know, this sort of, in effect, this, you know, what was referred to in that previous report as the talent pipeline has some blockages in it. And I think, um, and I think you know, it's, you know, we can influence these sorts of things with projects like SKA. 
Okay, um, what about engaging our, our communities in general? Uh, academic research is not conducted in an ivory tower anymore, if it ever was. Um, as an example, I'll give you some examples from here. There's a visitor facility here at Jodrell Bank called the Discovery Centre. It now attracts 140,000 visitors every year. That includes 16,000 school pupils that are on educational visits. Um, these are, as I've said at the bottom, these are the future users and funders of the SKA. Okay, um, so these are the people that we do need to be talking to. I visited this Discovery Centre when I was a kid. I grew up about 30 miles from here. So I came on a school visit. That inspired me. I am doing what I am doing now, doing now partly because of coming to, coming to Jodrell Bank. And that will be true for these people. And this applies to, obviously, similar facilities around the world that we have at our various um, telescopes. Um, Exhibitions in there includes things like the science and technology of big telescopes. There's a, there's a picture down there at the bottom that shows, a, actually it's based on the SKA, uh, one, of the, one of the baseline designs for the SKA array. And so you can switch on and off various telescopes and you can look at how that affects uh, radio imaging in terms of its um, resolution. So you can bring people quite closely um, into the science and the technology of what's going on. But in terms of a sort of, you know, that's an educational impact. In terms of a... Non, another non-science impact, um, we had a team of consultants that before we built this centre three years ago now, uh, came in and looked at what the impact of this centre was on the regional economy. And actually their estimate was that it would have a £27 million contribution to this local economy just around here over 10 years because of people coming into this centre, spending their money, staying locally. Um, and, and so that, in fact, that's almost certainly a big underestimate because it was based on visitor numbers that we massively overachieved on. So it's, we're probably double the number of visitor num numbers that we estimated in that particular uh, study. So there is, you know, there are impacts even on, in effect, it's the, it's the tourist economy. Um, I think if you're going to make, if, you, if the SK is going to have an impact on society outside of science, it needs to become part of culture. So, um, so, for example, what do we mean by culture? It means just, you know, the, the people outside of astronomy need to value it as part of what they understand by their, by their lives. Science has to become part of culture. And so you've got art, of course. A, big, a brilliant project that, that the SKA have already been involved with um, is the Shared Sky Project, which is basically working with artists in, uh, in both uh, South Africa and Australia um, to create collaborative works of art based on... Um, the, the connection to the sky and the impact of, of SKA. So a very clear impact on these, on, these local, on these local communities where those local communities will value that uh, facility. Um, music, another part of culture. Just an example, we, we, we run some music festivals here each summer. Um, over three years, they've attracted more than 40,000 people. It's quite a lot of people there all come to hear bands in the shadow of the Lovell telescope. We even project onto the telescope to make that uh, even more dramatic. That's a 250 foot wide um, projection screen in the background of that, of that stage there. While they're there, they listen to music, but they also hear about science. And so there's a science arena alongside the music arena, uh, and that features exhibitions from across um, the UK. Um, in this case, uh, universities and other organisations, including the SKA, and that people can come and talk to the actual scientists. We even did science from the main stage to uh, 10,000 people uh, in the crowd where we did uh, uh, live link-ups to the SKA sites in South Africa and in Australia. So I talked via Skype to people running, driving, that's uh, Rupert uh, down there driving the, uh, driving the Cat7 telescopes live from Cape Town to a crowd of 10,000 people in this music festival. So you're sort of inserting this science into, into culture. We know about film, of course. Contact, famously, um, inspired by the SETI work and inspired by the, and obviously featuring the VLA there, um, the DISH, um, featuring the Parkes telescope there and the, and, and the, the moon landings. Um, GoldenEye, even, with, with, with James Bond, featured the Arecibo telescope. It's not recommended that you fill your radio telescopes with water. Um, but that, that is uh, what happened in GoldenEye, uh, nor is it recommended that you slide down the, uh, down, down the dish into the centre, but that, but that did also happen there. In terms of Jodrell Bank, <laughs> also featured in a film, it's a very famous science fiction story called Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and there was a film made of that. And this is, the, this is we tried to suppress this photo, uh, but somehow it got in there. It was, uh, you know, the, the, when the aliens came to Jodrell Bank uh, with the spacecraft that arrived to destroy the world. So these, um, so these sorts of things do, you know, they are part, they've become part of popular culture. SKA has to become part of this as well. What about TV? 
Um, again, I'll just sort of highlight something that we, you know, we have personal experience of here that I think um, you know, has relevance to this. Um, we, we have a TV program here in the UK called Stargazing Live, which is run for uh, four years now. Um, the fifth series, the fifth annual series will be broadcast in March of next year. And it's basically three nights of astronomy broadcast live from here. So it's, uh, it's basically been an hour and a half programme each night live on national TV. It gets about three million viewers per episode, which, you know, is a, is a very significant number for a science programme. Um, we feature all sorts of science um, in, 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 in astronomy terms. So we, we feature astronomy from around the, around the world. Uh, we feature uh, space missions and so on. Um, and in fact, one of the things we did last year was quite, I think, quite an interesting um, thing. We, we, we actually had a citizen science project where we had um, the viewers looking for gravitational lenses. So they were looking online, uh, analysing images, looking for gravitational lens features. And then we actually discovered a new, uh, what looked like it might be a new Einstein ring um, one night on the programme. So after, the pro after it was announced on the programme, thousands and thousands and thousands, I think 50 odd thousand people logged on straight away and started analysing these uh, data and reporting, the, uh, reporting their observations. We found this source overnight. The team here actually um, scheduled an email in observation, so the network of radio telescopes in the UK. We observed that um, overnight. In fact, it started observing while the programme was going live on the second night and they actually stayed up most of the night and reduced the data and analysed it and produced the image that's at the bottom right there to be broadcast on the third night of the programme. So it's actually real live radio astronomy that was, that was presented to an audience of, of three million people and people were really engaged with it. And then just on the sort of wider sort of um, uh, <coughs> cultural side of things, what about heritage? There's been a big move of, in recent times to ensure that science is seen as part of heritage. Um, so in particular for world heritage, um, it's generally seen to be um, historic monuments, um, archaeology and so on. Um, but in fact, science has sort of been missing a little bit from that. And I think we've got, Jodrell Bank now is on the UK's shortlist for World Heritage Site status uh, on the UNESCO list. So we'll be looking towards inscribing that as a World Heritage Site as basically representing a place, as an example of a place, uh, where a new science basically developed from the 1940s onwards. Um, to the present day. And it's sort of you know, recognising that these, the science that we do does actually impact on, um, on humanity in terms of our, in this case, in terms of our understanding of the, of the world around us. So just to finish, what about SKA in 2050? Um, what, what do we imagine then? It's, it'd be 30 years after inception. So it's 30 years after, you know, the, the telescope's been, been constructed and starting to do um, science. Just to compare it to these, to these analogues um, that I mentioned, CERN was founded in 1954. That's 60 years ago. Um, so, you know, um, so we'd still have a way to go yet, even in 2050. Um, but it's an interesting thing to, to think about. And again, Jodrell Bank here, we, we, we came to public attention in 1957, I think, with the launch of Sputnik 1. And the first thing that telescope did was tracking the, the rocket that carried Sputnik into space 57 years ago. And I think now this Jodrell Bank is, is what I think is true to say. It's an icon for science and engineering in the UK. So, so in other words, you know, in the sense of the word icon, it represents science and engineering to people. So people value this telescope as representative of the science, not, not just for the science it does, but in the, in the way that it actually represents it. We did a national survey uh, with a national opinion poster that showed that 54% of the UK population knew what Jodrell Bank was. That, that's a completely, you know, a completely random sample of the population. 54% is a huge proportion of the population knowing what a science facility facility is and it's because of that 50 odd years of doing the science and becoming part of the culture and we were we were we won a vote as the great UK's greatest unsung landmark in 2007 the BBC poll so I think in 2050 what will SKA be it'll be an international icon so Jodrell Bank might well be a UK icon but but SKA has has the power to be a global icon uh, it will have delivered world leading science for decades it will have made a difference a real difference to its local communities and local, you know, define it how you like, but it goes from very local to, to, to regional to continental scales. Uh, and it will be inspiring future generations worldwide. And I think it's, uh, it's very exciting. I'm very pleased <coughs> to, to have a minor part in being involved with it. Okay, thank you.